We're going to be talking about accomplishing the impossible with God. And if you have your Bibles, you could turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. If you have one of our free Bibles, it's going to be page 145 there. But I want to give you the backdrop. Joshua is not Moses. If you've known up until this point, Moses has done phenomenal things with the Lord. Moses talks to the Lord face to face and the Shekinah glory would be absorbed in Moses and he would come down from the mountain. And as he's talking with the children of Israel, his face radiated and they're like, put a veil over your face. You're freaking us out. They were scared. Moses had a relationship with God like none other. But Moses is not leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Joshua is. And the task before Joshua is huge. Millions of people are looking to him. Now, he's always been an assistant. When Moses was in the tent praying, Joshua was there. But on the side, Moses was the main person. But now Joshua is called to step forward. And we get the sense that Joshua feels a bit of insecurity. To kind of give us the backdrop, if you turn to num- or numbers, uh, Deuteronomy 31, uh, verse 6, God is charging Israel, be strong and courageous when you go into the land. Be strong and courageous, don't be afraid or dread of them. For the Lord your God is the one who is going with you. He will not desert you or abandon you. That's the charge to Israel. Verse 7 of chapter 31, then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you will go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you will give it to them as an inheritance, and the Lord is the one who is going ahead of you, and he will be with you. He will not desert you. He will not abandon you. Do not fear or be dismayed. A charge to Joshua, you need to stand firm, and you need to be courageous. Not too long after that, verse 23, he commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you will bring the sons of Israel into the land, which I swore to them, and I will be with you. You get the sense that as Joshua steps into this new season of life, there's some insecurity that he's feeling. He's nervous. Moses gives the parting speech, blesses the tribes, knows that they're going to go astray, At the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 9, Joshua is described as being filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands upon him. And then we get to verse 1 of chapter 1. So read with me. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, to the sons of Israel. Joshua is reminded of the reality of the situation. Moses is dead. Let that resonate with Joshua. Why is this important? Joshua has been mentored by Moses for decades. Decades. He's the assistant to Moses at all times. But Joshua cannot grow into the man that he is called to be if he's still in the shadow of Moses. Does that make sense? So God removes Moses from him. And you read about that in Deuteronomy. Now it's Joshua's turn to step up. How many of us today have had Moseses in our lives? Spiritual fathers, spiritual mentors. They'd have poured into us year after year after year, decade after decade, maybe. And there comes a point when you need to step out and become the man, to become the woman that God has created you to be. But you can't do it in the shadow of your mentor anymore. There comes a time when you need to step out in faith, be strong and courageous where God is calling you, and to know that God has gone ahead of you, but you need to obey and do that step. Now, God will remove mentors from our lives. Moses dies. Sometimes it's by way of death. Sometimes it's by way of life change and situation, geographic location change. Sometimes it's through a variety of things, maybe through the disappointment of a mentor that has fallen from the position that they used to have. There could be a variety of reasons, but here's the point. You cannot grow into the person God has called you to be if you stay in the shadow of that person. So God's going to move them. God gives the reality to Moses 
Joshua, listen to me. Moses is dead. Arise. Cross. Those are two imperatives. Those are non-optional. You cannot stay on this side of the Jordan and fulfill what I have commissioned you to do. I need you to get up and I need you to move forward. Why? Because I am giving this land, this people, everything to you. Now Moses came to the Jordan before, but he never crossed it. Now Joshua is going to take that journey. And the Jordan's not that big. It's like a dirty canal is what it's. It's not why. You're not talking like cross Lake Mead and I'm going to take you across. It is not that big at all. But it separates from where you are to where God wants you to be. And you're going to have to cross that. And you're going to have to step out. All of your insecurities, you're going to have to step out in faith. And Joshua was reminded of this. You see, God calls his people then, as he does now, that you can't stay in the same place and be the same person as you're walking with Jesus. You can't. If you're walking with the Lord, your life is changing every day. Your relationship with God is changing every day. We are growing. We should be growing every day in obedience, but you're never the same place. So we are called to walk with him. We are called to trust him, but we are called and we are charged, but the decision in us is ours to stay on this side of the Jordan or are you going to cross the Jordan? So spiritually speaking, what's the Jordan River in your life right now that you see where God wants you to be? but you got to obey him and you got to step out in faith. Because right now it's been pretty comfortable staying on this side. But if you think about crossing over, there's insecurities. You feel ill-equipped. You're not called to do this. What about the unknown? What about the ifs? What about, what about a career uh, decision, an education decision, a geographic move decision, whatever it is. But God is clearly calling you to trust him Arise, your season here is done. You need to move forward. State the reality of the situation. But God reminds us that what is ahead of us, if he's calling you there, he's already gone before you. He's already gone before you. He's already prepared the way. Read with me verse 3. Every place, God's still speaking. Every place on which the sole of your foot steps, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. God will displace your enemies before you even get there. Notice how he's speaking. I have given it to you. It's completed action. It's done. Joshua hasn't even stepped across the Jordan yet. But God says when you move in obedience, it's already done. You will fulfill what I have called you to do and I will displace your enemies. I will go before you and you don't have to worry about it. This is all in fulfillment of the promise. Verse four, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. God is describing a vast amount of geography for him. And he says, all of this that you have yet to see, Israel, Joshua saw it. He was one of the spies. He surveyed the land. Out of those spies, only two came back with a positive report. They're like, let's go in and take it. Everybody else is like, nah, they're giants in there. They're too big. We can't do it. Look at us. We are ill-equipped. We're farmers and herdsmen. We shepherd sheep. We're not like the Amalekites that are super tall and they're bred for war. I know what God is doing. The answer is no, we can't do it. Joshua and Caleb say, let's do it. They're the only faithful ones out of that group. But God is saying, look it, I'm going to give everything to you. All of it. All of this is the description of God's promise to Joshua. He's going to enter it and he's going to rule in it. And God is going to go before him. We got to remember that when God is calling you to do something in his name, again, career change, education, geographic, it doesn't matter. If God is calling you to do something, he's gone before you and he's already displaced in his timeline the enemies that are going to oppose you. But the decision comes down to you and to me. Here's what God says. Will you step out in obedience or will you recoil in fear? 
because it's a lot safer on this side of the Jordan. I mean, good Lord, we've been wandering around this side of the Jordan for 40 years. I think I'm pretty comfortable with all the desert scenery here. But that's not what you were meant for. You were meant for something greater. But that means I have to leave familiarity. Yeah, it does. That means I'm going to have to embrace insecurity that Jesus, I can't do this without you. Yeah, it is. But the decision is yours. You can move in obedience or you can stay in disobedience and repeat the cycle over and over again. Verse 5, God continues, no one will be able to oppose you. Oh, I love that. All the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not desert you nor abandon you. As Joshua follows the Lord, the Lord will be with his side in all things. Think about the reality that the Lord is speaking directly to Joshua. Nobody will oppose you. That means nobody's going to get victory over you. Are you going to have opposition when you live for Jesus? Yes, you will. People are going to oppose. But God is not talking about you're not going to have anybody come up against you and disagree with you. Nobody will have victory over you. Why? Because I will be with your side. I will be by you day in and day out. And this reminds me of a, of a promise that Paul gives us. If you turn to Romans 8, verse 31, it's on page 757. Notice what Paul says, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Different time context, a couple thousand years, several thousand years removed from Joshua. But even Paul understood if we are walking with the Lord, who can truly defeat you or oppose you? Now, we might think, well, that means I'm invincible. I'm going to be immortal on eternity's level. Yeah, not on this earthly level. Paul died. Peter was died. If you read the Fox's book, Some Martyrs, they, all of them, except for John, the, uh, John who wrote the gospel of John and the books of John in Revelation, traditionally speaking, because it's not recorded in scripture how he dies, but John is the only one who dies an old man. After he's thrown into an, a cauldron of boiling oil, he escapes without a mark, church history records. Paul is beheaded. Peter is crucified upside down. Timothy and Titus were filleted alive, ripped apart. All these torturous, barbaric things. So God's not talking victory that you're going to be immortal, physically speaking. He's talking about, eternally speaking, who can truly be against you. Because this world is but a breath, Ecclesiastes says. We're, we're just but a vapor. We're here and we're gone. But God is reminding Joshua, I will be with every adventure that I have called you to take. You are never alone in the darkest valleys or on the mountaintop peaks. I am with you. I have called you for this. But you need to remember that promise as you face opposition. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Again, we see from Deuteronomy into Joshua, we see another set of commands. Be strong and courageous. Those are non-optional. Be strong and courageous. So by this time, I'm beginning to think, okay, I got to define what strong and courageous means. I mean, I got the Oxford Dictionary of English here. But what is God talking about in the Hebrew? What is he talking about in the original language? Be strong, it means to be strengthened. Stand firm where you're at. Courageous is facing and engaging, and engaging danger in the presence of fear. Facing and engaging the danger that is causing you to tremble, that's what courageous means. So I need you to stand firm, and I need you to not run from the danger, the fear. I need you to engage it. But Lord, I'm, my knees are shaking, I know. I need you to do what's right in God's eyes, even when it's making you quiver in fear. So this is several times God has repeated this to Joshua. I think we need to listen that Joshua probably had a lot of insecurity. Joshua, you're going to step into a land Moses never did. 
You're going to lead multi-millions of people into this land. You're going to displace people. I've gone ahead of you. It's going to be a whole nother season, and I need you, Joshua. I know Moses reminded you. I reminded you. I'm here to tell you again. I need you to stand firm, and I need you to engage the danger that causes you to be afraid because I'm going to be with you. I've told you what's going to happen, but the decision is yours to step. I'm commanding you, but you can be rebellious. You see, God's reminders rest upon his promises, not our insecurities. That should bring us great comfort. Because there are some things that God is calling me to. There are some things that I would never volunteer at all to do. But if I prayed about it, if I filtered it through through counsel, and I know this is the path that God is calling me to do, I need to take a deep breath and say, you know what, Lord? Okay, here we go. Um, I got to make some changes in my life, but I want to be where you're at. Because if I can be where you're at, I can be reminded of your presence and that you will make me courageous, that I can trust you. Verse 7, I guess Joshua didn't get it in verse 6. Only be strong and very courageous. Why would he say very courageous? Because I think Joshua is afraid of the unknown future that lies ahead of you and all the what-ifs that come with it. And he's going to step out of familiarity and step into an unknown, and God is going to walk with him and grow his faith in ways that Joshua has yet to experience. Are you there today? Think about that. Is God calling you to move in a direction where you're like, if you think about it, you get some anxiety. There are some things that begin to rise up, but it's like, I know, I know, I know that we are called to do this. I'm called for this or whatever it is, but I am utterly terrified. Well, God is saying, I need you to face that danger. I need you to engage with it because God is the one who's going to strengthen you. And when you get victory in that area, God is the one who gets the glory. It's not you. But notice what he tells Joshua. Be strong, be very courageous. Okay, I'm ready for this. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. If we're going to be strong and very courageous, let's continue. Do not turn from it for the right or the left so that you may achieve success wherever you go. If I can paraphrase this, my paraphrase, take it or leave it. Joshua, I need you to be strong. And engage what you are afraid of most of all. Because I'm going to strengthen you. Now, I need you to be careful to walk with me, learn from me, obey what I tell you. Don't think that you know more than I do. And go do it your own way. If you follow me where I am going, you will be successful in all that you do. But you got to stay by my side, Joshua. You got to follow me. Don't get ahead of me and try to make me follow you, because you're going to get lost. Stay behind me. God will never call us to a place that he has not already paved the way for you. He won't call you to a place he's not already at. Remember the analogy of a shepherd. A shepherd is not a rancher. If you're a rancher, you're a cattle driver, you drive cattle from the rear. You whip them, you do whatever, you have sheepdogs, whatever it is, cattle... They're, you're driving cattle to get them from the rear to get to a point. And you can do a cattle drive doing that, but a shepherd leads in front and he speaks the sheep's name and the sheep fall in line behind the shepherd because they hear his voice. If you try to drive sheep like cattle, they're going to go everywhere. They're not going to listen. They're going to jump around. They're not. But if they know you and if they trust you, you can speak to them and lead them into their pen. They'll, they'll follow you. So if that's the case, and Christ is the ultimate shepherd, and we are all sheep, if God is calling you to a different season, that means the shepherd is already ahead of you. He's he's already there. He's already displaced your enemies. Those are going to come against you. But notice, these decisions fall in line with obedience. You got to be obeying the Lord. True Christ followers do not look for excuses to avoid obedience. If God is convicting us of a sin that we're harboring, that we're practicing, that we're playing with, whatever, you got to get rid of it. You're not going to move forward. And you're going to repeat the cycle over and over again. You're going to stay on this side of the Jordan 
because you refuse to get or surrender that sin to the Lord, so you're going to be stuck. Paralyzed by fear, a litany of excuses. But if we're going to cross that Jordan and we're going to follow the Lord into a new season of blessing, you got to leave behind the old ways. And all of us struggle with something. But are you surrendering it to the Lord? Big adventures. God wants us to always be, Lord, what am I harboring? I, I, I got to get this out of my life. And as a church, we need to be that church that's willing to walk with people, not just point their sin out. That doesn't take a genius. You know, that person is living in sin, and this person is living in sin, and that person, okay, well, congratulations, Pharisee. What are you doing to step into that life and help them to get out of that sin? Or maybe you're just judging. Maybe you like to be the one that announces everything, this person's living in sin, but are you the person to step into that area to say, how can I help you move past this sin? Or do you like the comfort of preaching that sin from a distance, but you don't like to engage with people that are broken? All of us have the Pharisee inside of us. All of us do. But we got to take that and submit and say, Lord, there's people that are struggling. How can we come alongside them and help them take their next steps with you? This is a long-term investment. Sometimes it might be a quick correction, but honestly, it's a long-term investment. But the reality is that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life and we're battling sin. You know what sin you need to take care of. But the fact is, we tend to be disobedient. Why? Because human history shows it. We're not that bright of a people. God says, I'm promising this. I'm prom I will part the Red Sea in front of you. And you're like, wow, this is supernatural. This is awesome. This is great. Hey, leave behind this sin. Well, I don't know. I don't think I heard you. We make excuses. But God says, look, you're coming to a point in your walk with me that I need you to shed this from your life. But if I give this up, what's going to happen? New things are going to happen. Because if God has to prune it from your life, it's going to hurt all the more. So God will bring us conviction. Conviction is not a bad word. We talk about it often. Conviction is a very good word. It means you're still sensitive to the Holy Spirit's direction in your life. Man, that's a great thing. I don't want to be so complacent with my sin that I no longer even feel conviction. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Life is life. This is what God is going to do. And then I become self-deceived. That's a dangerous place to be. I'm glad when I feel convicted or somebody comes alongside and says, hey, what's going on? It's like, you know what? You're right. You know why? Because take a look at this. I want to be successful wherever God calls me. Occupation, family, friends, influence, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be for me behind the pulpit. I want to be successful wherever God calls me. Well, then, John, you need to walk in obedience with me. Don't find an excuse to get around obeying me. You need to walk with me as Moses did, as Joshua did, as Peter did, as Jesus called us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, just as I kept my Father's commandments. It's a call to discipleship. But how do we do this? Let's read. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will achieve success. So look at this in the reverse order. I want to be prosperous, and I want to be successful for the Lord. Well then, John, back it up. You need to meditate upon the Word of God all the time. Don't let this become a paperweight in your house, a little nice coffee thing that when people come over on your coffee table, you have it open to Psalm 23 or something like that but you never engage it. We need to engage it. We need to be like, all right, here we go. But, you know, pastor, my life is so busy. I don't have time. And probably some of you do. You're working 70, 80 plus hours a week. You know what? I understand that. No excuse though, because you could download version Bible app. When I'm at the house, I'm pulling weeds. Like I think I breed weeds. I think I, I, think I cultivate weeds. I have... I have them. They never go away. So I'm out there with the hula hole and ground clear. I'm just nuking everything. I put version Bible up. I hit play on the book of Romans, and I'm just listening to the word of God. Let's be honest. We have more tools today for us than the church has ever had in her history. But we're lazy. 
We become spiritually lethargic. We got to figure out a way to meditate upon the word of God. The word meditate, we brought this up before. It means to chew the cud. It means as a cow, they chew the straw, the grass, they swallow it into the first stomach and then they throw it back up. That sounds beautiful. And then they extract and they eat and they chew more nutrients. They swallow it into the second stomach. You think you're done? Nope. They throw it back up again. They do that several times before it is eliminated. So they extract everything possible from what they're eating. When you meditate, the Bible is telling you to chew the cud. Devour it, but don't think you're done with it. Bring it back up. Digest it. Bring it back up. Digest it. Bring it back. Wrestle with it. Engage with it. Because we need to meditate upon this day and night. So in your own personal time, read Psalm 1. That's my challenge to you, is to read Psalm 1. We have you, Virgin Bible Lab. We have music. C- create an environment where you are encouraged to grow the right direction with Jesus instead of being pulled apart by all the things that are opposite of Jesus. Read books. Read how other people look at their journey, look at their life, look at how they're engaging, whether they're dead or whether they're still alive. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Create an atmosphere. And you will be prosperous and successful if we walk in step with the Lord. The opposite is also true. You will be unsuccessful and you will not be prosperous if you're finding ways to disobey God and still trying to manipulate manipulate Him to bless you. You're going to have sin in the camp. And when sin is in the camp and when you know that sin is in the camp and you don't do anything about it, you're not going anywhere until you make the decision to say, I really, really like this because I really, it's fun. But Lord, it doesn't bring you honor. And I'm laying it before you. I'm casting it out. Because when God has to send something through the camp to get rid of it, it's a lot more painful. It's a lot more painful. Uh, Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Okay, Joshua, here we go again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The word dismayed is to be downhearted. You're downhearted. You're in a state where your heart is heavy. Be strong. Face the danger. I will be with you. Do not be terrified. That's interesting because that goes into, dovetails into the word courageous. Confront the terror. Do not be terrified or downhearted. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is reminiscent of Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go and baptize. All nations, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you even to the end of age. You're never alone. You're never alone. When God reminds us of who we are in Him, it's because we need to hear it. Because the enemy loves to whisper into your subconscious, in your ear, however you want, and he wants to tell you how you are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. You're not good enough. Remember all that sin. Remember everything. You're such a hypocrite. All the lies that he throws in, because he's a father of lies. But God is telling Joshua, look it, I'm charging you. You can become the man that I've called you to be. But Joshua, I need you to cross that Jordan. I've gone ahead of you. I prepped the land for you. All the stuff that you're going to encounter, I'm there already. Cross the Jordan. Cross it because you were never meant to stay on this side of the Jordan. And there's people looking up to you that are going to follow your lead. So I believe, as is well as here, I believe today, God desires his children to walk in boldness, leaning on him. And when it gets terrifying and you become terror-filled, your heart is heavy, remember that God accomplishes the impossible through you. All the things that we are afraid of, God will be there. So let me give you some several parting words of encouragement. Number one, trust the Lord's promises. Trust them. They're here. If we're going to meditate upon the word of God, it's here. There's promises that are timeless. They're not bound by geography. They're not bound by ethnicity. They're bound by being a child, a born-again child of God. And God has blessings for us. God will be with us, but you got to trust the promises, especially when you're feeling insecure. 
If you prayed through something and God is leading you to a whole scary adventure, it's probably because he's equipping you for it right now, but he's going to test your faith. He's going to allow it to be presentable. We can bring it to the Lord, but you got to remember and trust his promises. Number two, surrender to the Lord's plans. Surrender. Stop trying to be the control freak. Stop it. Surrender to the Lord's plans. If you trust his promises and you've received counsel and wisdom from people that are walking with the Lord, that you trust, surrender. Raise the white flags. All right, I've been trying to do it my way. It's not working. I need to get this done. I need to get it done. And lastly, you need to move forward in confidence, not arrogance. Move forward in strength and courage because God is going ahead of you. And he has called you to be the man, to be the woman that he has called you to be. But that means leaving familiarity and step into what he has for you. And that means letting go of some things that you should have been let go a long time ago. A long time ago. But we're talking forward progress. Progress toward perfection. We're imperfect, but we worship a perfect God. And the reality is all of us are under construction. So when you get reminded that you're not a completed project yet, you're not the finished project of God, God will be faithful to complete what he started in you on the day of Christ Jesus. He's not going to fail you. But I can tell you this from experience, that when we linger in disobedience, man, that season lasts a lot longer than what it should originally have. God says he charges, he presents it. I promise I'm not going to leave you. But you got to step across that Jordan. That's your decision. You got to weigh that. We always encourage people, look at it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. It starts there. And if you don't know what that means, look, at it's admitting that you have rebelled against God. You've sinned. You've, you're doing it your own way. And your lifestyle reflects you're doing it your own way. Lord, I rebelled against you, and I'm in a season of utter brokenness. I, I'm becoming numb to your convictions. I'm broken, but I believe that Jesus came to earth to live a life, die for me, purchase me. My sins are bought and sealed and covered. I believe that he died for my sins and he rose again the third day. I believe that. And today I'm making a decision to follow you. Surrendering. Right now, I surrender it all. Surrendering means you bring it before God and you back away from it. It's not like you bring it before God and you're leaving just one hand there because if God doesn't show up, you're just going to pull it right back. Surrendering means you've raised the white flag. I'm done. God wants us to surrender. Joshua surrendered to the Lord as he walked with Moses, and God grew him. There may be some today that are in this building listening online. You know about Jesus, but you've never surrendered to Jesus. You've always held an ace up your sleeve, just in case I got a way out. Well, that's religion. And we're talking about a relationship. And I encourage you, if you have not made that relationship decision, admit that you're a sinner today. Surrender to Jesus and believe that he died for your sins and that he's offering you the gift of salvation for free and call upon him and trust him and invite him to come into your life because he will radically change you if you surrender to him. But if you hold a little bit back, I'm going to just try this Jesus thing for you know, a quick minute here. You're not surrendering. You're still trying to lead Jesus instead of you following him. You just place yourself ahead of him. Would you please bow your heads with me as we close? Father, as we come before you, we just want to lay our lives down. And Lord, it's my heart and it's my passion that anybody who hears any sermon, they are encouraged to do what's right in your eyes, even if it's going to cost something. And if there's any person that is lost or they're hiding behind religion because it's easier just to play the part on Sundays, 
wear the jewelry. We have the bumper sticker and we got the t-shirt too. But Lord, it is painful to make decisions that are right in your eyes and we're walking with you. Lord, if there's anybody here that has never made that decision genuinely, Lord, I pray that you would break their hearts. I pray that they would surrender to you. Jesus, you paid the price. It's done. And you invite people, come follow me. Come and follow me. There is a new life ahead of you if you would just cross this Jordan. I've promised I would never leave you. I've equipped you for the task ahead. But you got to take the step. Lord, today, all of us, believer and non, would you empower us to take that next step? Maybe coming to you to faith for the first time. Maybe it's stepping into ministry. Maybe it's volunteering. Maybe it's getting over our hangups and we're just moving forward with you. Lord, you've equipped us. You're there. And if we want to move and grow in this season, help us to trust you with all that we have. That we would stand firm, face the danger, utterly terrified, but knowing full well that you are with us. We love you. We thank you. And we ask for this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to talk with me uh, about what it means to follow Christ, I would love to talk with you. Get with myself. Get with another believer that you know. Uh, we want to make sure that you know you are a follower of Christ. And in our free Bibles, right here in the front, it lets you know how to have that relationship as well. I'll be gone for the next several weeks. So you'll have Dr. Cannon and Pastor Felton preaching in the next several weeks. So I'll see you guys in three weeks. Until then, be the hands, be the feet, be the mouthpiece of Jesus. Everywhere you go and shine bright what God has done for you. God bless you. And I'll see you in about a month.